you know, we, we, we can't imagine what it must have been like. I mean, Bethlehem that night, uh, that particular, that particular uh, event and, or time, time went on because we know uh, that people didn't just come to town, do the thing and leave. They stayed for a while because you can't just, like, unlike today, you can't just jump in the car and head back home. Um, so I can only imagine how overwhelming it must have been for that little town as people began to come in and overcrowd the place. And uh, I grew up around High Point. And you all know, you know, you ever been through High Point before in North Carolina? High Point is the um, furniture capital of the world. Um, what's interesting, though, about High Point, it just it continues to change all the time. We had, a, we had a mall, Westchester Mall, that I worked at Belts for a couple years. In fact, I was Belky Bear one year. Um, proud of that. Anyway, um, <laughs> But Westchester Mall closed down. They built another mall, and that closed down. And I always thought, that's the weirdest thing. They can't keep a mall. I have to go to Greensboro to go to a mall because High Point is a little bit larger than Roanoke. And, and it always fascinated me that, that they were having problems actually keeping businesses in there. But, but furniture business was a big deal in High Point. It's a huge deal. And, and every year you would have the furniture market, people would come to town and overwhelm the town. And uh, all the hotels would get filled up. People would actually rent their houses, still do that, rent their houses and that kind of stuff, and they'll rent it really good price, and they'll go live somewhere else and so forth. And the town got crazy. You just did not go on Main Street during the furniture market. You, you, know, you, you would find the back roads and so forth. You just avoided Main Street and avoided certain sections of town. But, and it was crazy. You couldn't go out and eat. You couldn't do anything hardly during the furniture market because everything was just so crowded. But can you imagine a small town like Bethlehem, just a little town right outside of Jerusalem that uh, is just overwhelmed and they can't handle everything that's, that's taking place. And sometimes, you know, we, we get overwhelmed at Christmas, don't we? Uh, thank God for Amazon. You can, you can do a lot of your Christmas shopping online. <laughs> don't tell the other stores I said that. But anyway, um, but you go to Walmart, you go to the mall. That kind of, we went to the mall yesterday and I just like, uh, anyway, it's, it's, it's crowded, it's chaotic, and, and it really, be honest with you, if you let it, it, it can really overwhelm you um, to the point where, you know, you're not quite as happy as you should be. And it, it gets crazy, and you go places, and, and, and I, I don't know about you, but, I, you know, I don't like, I don't mind being around people, but I don't like crowds like this, you know what I'm saying? I don't like going places where the seat is very small. You know, I, I, one of the things I hate is getting on an airplane. And you got those little seats and the person in front of you wants to lean back. And you, I mean, you just, you feel like this on an airplane a lot of times. And, 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 and it's just not a good feeling. In fact, when I was a kid, my mom will tell you, when I was a kid, every time I got in a crowd, I would start crying. My dad would have to take me to the bathroom um, and, and calm me down because I did not like being around people. <laughs> Boy, God's got a sense of humor. <laughs> you know, but it's, it, things can happen for whatever reason and we can get overwhelmed with so much. But then there's the good kind of overwhelmed. Can you imagine how overwhelmed the shepherds were that night? Can you imagine? I, I can imagine after the angels left, I mean, there was probably a, the scripture doesn't tell us, but there was probably a long pause because they were looking at each other. They knew what they needed to do, but they were trying to get their minds around what had just happened. It, we look at this text in Luke chapter 2, and this story never grows old. We read this story over and over again, this narrative over and over again. Sometimes if we, get, we can get in a rut, we, get, we, we forget the historical significance of this event. As the text tells us, in the same region, there were some shepherds staying out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock at night. They were doing what they did every night. And the angel of the Lord suddenly stood near them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terribly frightened. And so the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which will be for all 
the people. For today in the city of David, there has been born for you a Savior who, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign. You will find the babe wrapped in cloths, lying in a manger. And suddenly there appeared with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts saying, and praising God, saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among people with whom he is pleased. So there's a promise of peace, but it's for those who pursue him. Verse 15, when the angels had departed from them in the heaven, the shepherds began saying to one another, and like I said, I, I, I just imagine a pause. And they say, let's go straight to Bethlehem then and see this thing that has happened which the Lord has made known to us. And they came in a hurry and found their way to Mary and Joseph and the baby as he lay in the manger. And when they had seen him, they made known the statement which had been told them about this child. They began to explain to Mary and Joseph what they had experienced in verse 18. And all who heard it were amazed about the things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary treasured, underline that word, Mary treasured all these things, pondering them in her heart, and the shepherds went back glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen just as it had been told to them. There is a wrong way to be overwhelmed. Sometimes we get overwhelmed because we get anxious. We get fearful. Anxiety creeps in or, or maybe just people are just getting on your nerves. Whatever it may be, you're overwhelmed and there's a there's a wrong way to be overwhelmed. and It's telling when we get overwhelmed sometimes, that's the moment we should pray. That's the moment we should discover that God's right there with us and there's no need to be overwhelmed. In other words, we may have those moments, but that doesn't mean we have to stay there. Do you hear what I'm saying? But then there's the right way where this word is something more beneficial, to be overwhelmed. As we observe these shepherds' response on, the day, on that particular day, they were overwhelmed in the right way. So what should we be overwhelmed about at Christmas? We can get overwhelmed with the shopping list. We can get overwhelmed with the shopping. We can get overwhelmed with the simple fact that there's too much going on at the same time. But what should we be overwhelmed about at Christmas? Number one, we should be overwhelmed with joy. With joy. That word right there in the Greek means joy. Great gladness. How, how do you receive joy? How, how do you experience joy? Well, the text actually gives us a hint. I bring you good news that will present great joy. I bring you good tidings of great joy. And keep in mind, there in this particular time, as I said before, the people of Israel were under the thumb of the Romans. This was not a comfortable time to live in fact, it was a very uncomfortable time to live if you choose to worship one God. If you choose, uh, we think Christians are picked on today. Folks, back then, it was, it was a, a, because Roman culture had put so much pressure on people around them that they, they're thinking to themselves, how in the world could we Ever worship one God? What about the God of this and the God of that and the God of this and the God of that? Wait a minute, you're leaving out this God. In fact, Paul talked about later on, he walked into the town and, and there and he noticed that they have an image to the unknown God. In other words, they had an image uh, just in case they left the God out. They didn't want to hurt his feelings, so they set up this image of an unknown God. To them, it, was, it didn't make sense for us to worship one God. 
In fact, Nero hated the Christians so much that he blamed the Christians for the fire that, took, that went down in Rome. And it intensified the persecution. But here we read Jesus says, in the midst of all the crazy that's going on around you, I've come to give you joy. Joy. We can respond to life's difficulties with genuine joy if we know that the Lord has a purpose for why He would allow difficult times and suffering and trials. In James chapter 1, we see that the purpose for trials was to produce something in us. Produce patience, endurance, to be able to get through those difficult moments that it gives us the ability to hold up under trials. He says, look, in the midst of the chaos, I am bringing you good news that should bring you great joy. Because Jesus had come to the world just as God had promised, the Messiah, the Anointed One, the Christ, has come. And you may not understand it all now, but you're going to look back and you're going to count this as great joy. In fact, that's what James chapter 1 tells us. Consider it all joy when you go through what? Various trials, tribulations, and difficulties. So even in the midst of the crazy, because you have trusted Jesus, that alone should bring you joy. If it doesn't bring you joy, then check your faith. God's Word says, without faith, it is impossible to please God. Absolutely impossible. Because if you really, really trust God and you trust Jesus and His provision, it should bring on joy. Not only that, but number two, we should be overwhelmed with unexplained peace. Along with that joy comes peace. That word peace means tranquility. A moment of quiet. I never will forget that uh, when Amy graduated from college, her mom sent us on a cruise together. And before we went on a cruise, she took us on a cruise where the kids were there. So we had to we had to entertain the kids. So wherever the kids went, we had to go, and the kids were being kids, and, and there's other kids being kids, and it was noisy, right? You go, you go to places, and you, and you go to Chuck E. Cheese. It's going to be noisy. <laughs> the food's terrible, but no, I'm kidding. I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm, I'm kidding. It, it's, it's, I've, I've had better is the point. But anyway, the point is, the point of going to Chuck E. Cheese is not so much the, the cuisine, it is so your kids can have a good time, right? I'm okay with that. But I don't forget when Amy and I went on the cruise together, just me and her, oh man, I loved it. I, I, I loved the fact that we didn't have to worry about anybody but her and myself. And, I, and we got to go on this area called the Serenity. That's where there's no kids allowed. And we got there, and it was quiet. And they had these nice little cushion things that you sit on, and you relax, and you sit in that little uh, uh, jacuzzi, and you just relax, and, and you might have a, a conversation with somebody in there, and, and it's just quiet and nice. You can read a book without any disturbance out. I mean, beautiful, beautiful. And, and, I, and, I, and I thought to myself, I don't want this day to end. <laughs> I mean, I'm laying back, and I'm just like, Man, this is good. Thank you, Lord. And that's what this word means. Tranquility. That in the midst of the crazy that we know is still going on around us, we have, can have moments like those moments of serenity, those moments when things are crazy, but we can have that moment when we know without a doubt in our mind that God is right there with us and everything is going to be all right. 
So we can be overwhelmed with unexplained peace. Because along with joy is peace. It's peace number three. We can be overwhelmed by His presence. Can you imagine what it must have been like for the shepherds and magi to walk into that room knowing that that child is God the Son. God manifesting Himself and a little eight-pound little boy. We don't know exactly how, how much he weighed. Let's just assume eight or nine-pound little boy. And to see that little face and to know that you're looking in the face of God. Can you imagine how much, how much if they really had a full understanding, I know they did, especially the Magi, they had a full understanding, I believe. Shepherds did too, but I think the Magi really got it. That's why they traveled so far. They traveled a long ways just to have that moment with the king of all kings. Can you imagine what it must have been like to be in the presence of God that they were the first ones to get to worship the one who, along with the Father and the Holy Spirit, spoke the world into existence, spoke the universe into existence. Which, by the way, when you think about God's presence, you can't help but think about what He created. I mean, scientists cannot figure out, they have no clue how large this universe is. They just know it's so large, it's beyond even measurement. They, they come up with measurements, but they don't know what's beyond what they measure. And they look at the universe and they, and they say, and, and, and whether they're, in fact, I don't think there's a, a serious science, scientist that's atheist. In fact, a lot of them become agnostic because they've discovered, they always talk about the Big Bang. That, that's just their way of saying something got something started. It had to start somewhere. It had a beginning. The universe had a beginning. And that beginning cannot be lesser than the results. Do you hear what I'm saying? An atheist would say something lesser made something greater. That's hogwash. That doesn't make sense. There has to be something bigger than the universe to, to be able to make this universe happen. And however long the timeline you want to put, it's beside the point. God Himself, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, Genesis chapter 1, Elohim, H-I-M, that's the plural ending for God. It recognizes God as creator, the creator of the universe. When he said, I'm going to make man in our image, he spoke of the Trinity right there in Genesis 1. And Father, Son, Holy Spirit spoke the universe in existence. And our minds cannot imagine how large this universe must be. And it's still expanding. And the miracle of knowing. Listen, I'm not trying to go too much in details, but I, I'm just reading this book recently. I just like, it's just fascinating that everything is perfect. Do you realize if the earth was just a little bit bigger, a little bit smaller, it wouldn't be able to sustain life? Do you realize if it wasn't on the right kind of axis, there's no way it can sustain life? Do you realize that because of the distance it is from the sun and how big the sun is, and even how big the moon is, all of that in place has to be just right for this world to sustain life. Why do you think we're having such a hard time finding life beyond planet Earth? Not to say there's not, not life out there. I don't know what God's got going on. But look, you look at the universe and it's like, there's nothing coming close to what we have here. And to say all that just happened? And the God of the universe, God himself sent his son, manifested himself Jesus spent nine months in Mary's womb just like we spend nine months in our mother's womb. And, he, and Mary gave birth to a son. And from the point of the announcement and conception until the end, the virgin birth is so significant for us to understand 
because we talked about that on the podcast in a couple weeks, in fact, and, and listen to it because there's so much significance in the fact that Jesus was born of a virgin. Fully man, but without a sin nature. Listen. Can you imagine if the shepherds had known that night, maybe they had some understanding, but if they just, perhaps they did. I mean, think about it. Angels showed up out of nowhere, made an announcement. Go worship this one who has been born. The only person you worship is God. So they knew, they knew, they were seeing God in the flesh. Can you imagine how overwhelmed they were of just being in his presence? Number four, overwhelmed with motivation to worship. I believe that when you really take the moment to think about and meditate on who Jesus is and how he came, it will motivate you to worship. Listen, we're all wired to worship. God has created us with this innate need, this need to worship something or someone. So my question is this, what is important to you? Who is important to you? Because whatever is really important to you is where you spend the majority of your time focusing on. Albert Tate put it this way. It, you know, when, you, when God gave us the Ten Commandments, it, it wasn't just a set of rules. It was an invitation to have a relationship with the Holy God. And when he says to have know the gods before him and, and to worship him alone. He, he was asking you to define the relationship, as Albert Tate put it. The DTR is kind of like when you're dating. You know, you're dating for a while and then there reaches a point where you have to do what? You have to define the relationship, right? It, it, it is, are we just going to date each other exclusively? Just, or, and, then, and then we really define that relationship when we put a ring on her hand, Right? We get down on one knee and we present that ring. And most, most guys nowadays, though, they want to make sure they got to they gotta be 99% sure she's going to say yes before they do that. <laughs> but in fact, I, you know, I, 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 I probably shouldn't share this, but <laughs> this was so important to me that I want to make sure I got the right thing. So I took Amy's mom with me. Deborah went with, me, went, went with me and we picked out the ring because I wanted to make sure that she understood that I wanted what she wanted. And I had, on that particular day, defined the relationship that I am committed to you for the rest of my life. And God is asking us to define the relationship with Him when we are totally committed to Him. When we're totally committed to Him. Wow. It makes all the difference in the world in how we conduct ourselves, how much time we spend alone with God, how important worship is for us, how important Bible study is for us, how important prayer is for us. We're overwhelmed when we think about what God did for us and we are motivated to worship. You know, the reason people tend to put their affection and attention on other things or other people is because you lose that all of God or you lose patience with God. But when you focus on His handiwork, when you think about His omnipresence and when you think about the wonder of it all and you look around and you take your head up and actually look around and see what's in front of you, you see the details, you investigate the details from macro to micro, you see the hand of God. And you're in awe. 
And in those moments of awe, those moments that should be frequent, we take the time to worship. And number five, we should be overwhelmed with treasured memories. What does the text say? That Mary treasured the things that they were telling her and she pondered them in her heart. It's kind of a, a rhetorical question that we ask. And Mark Lauer wrote that song, Mary, Did You Know? It's, it's a question. You know, and it was affirmed as she listened to the shepherds, as she listened to the magi, as she took it all in and she pondered those things in her heart. But can you imagine how overwhelming it must have been for Mary to come to the realization that the one that she just delivered will soon deliver her. Overwhelmed with treasured memories. Do you remember the moments that God gave you mercy? Do you remember the moments that God delivered you from an issue or a situation? Do you remember those moments as you look back, you remember where you were and you thought to yourself, man, I don't know if I'm going to make it on the other side, but here you are. You remember the good times and the bad times. And do you remember that when you called out to God and you drew near to Him, that He drew near to you? Do you recall those moments when it seems like There's no way you're going to get through it. I got through it last time, but there's just no way I'm going to get through it this time. <laughs> Isn't it amazing how quickly we forget the goodness, the mercy, the patience of God? Isn't it amazing that sometimes when things happen to us, we can't help but think, well, this must be the one, that's going, this must be the zinger, this is what's going to take me out. But in those moments, in those moments, we approach the throne of God and He gets us through. You get on the other side of it and you realize that God was teaching me something there. In fact, that's what James 1 tells us. The reason why we have to go through difficult moments and challenges and trauma and, and tragedy is because God is developing us for a purpose. If you're going to pray for God's will to be done in your life, you've got to be willing to take on the difficult moments before you get there. And what I mean by that is that God's will sometimes is for you to go through that difficult moment because there's something He wants to do with you on the other side of that moment. Just think how indifferent, complacent, and unthankful you can become if everything always went well for you. And I think that's part of the problem of American Christianity is that we're so spoiled rotten that we look a lot like the church of Laodicea. Where we're neither hot or cold. And it makes God nauseous. Perhaps the reason why sometimes we don't see things take place is because we've become complacent. And, and, and sometimes it may be because you, you only choose to pray when things are not going well. Jesus Himself demonstrated over and over and over again how important it is for us to spend time alone with the Father. Here it is, God the Son who didn't have a sin nature, a man who knew no sin, took countless hours praying to the Father. 
He spent 40 days in the, in the wilderness without food and drink and just praying and, and preparing himself for whatever's next. So if you're having a bad day and you don't understand why things are happening the way they are, think for a moment, how did you start out that day? When things are going bad, things are going difficult. If you started out that day and give God your best time, your best moments, and you spend time pouring your heart out to God and, and just having a, having a conversation with God and just experiencing His presence and taking a moment to have that personal time of worship, I tell you, you may still have bad moments during that day, but God will certainly be with you through in those moments and He will get you through that day before you can even think that it actually happened. It happens over and over and over again. But we got to take the time to just think, pray, and meditate. Our brother, a couple weeks ago, talked about being. You remember that message? Learning to be in the presence of God. Hanging out with God. Right? Y'all treasure those moments. Those moments when you get to Lean in to your spouse and maybe watch a movie. One of you may fall asleep, but you still enjoy that moment, right? You're not really having a conversation. You're just enjoying the presence, right? We should take those moments and enjoy God's presence. Clear our minds and sit there and just two or three minutes and just don't say anything. And then just, just start having a conversation with God. Jesus told us to model prayer. He didn't intend for us to pray that exact words every day. He just gave us a, an outline. And just take that outline and pray and just spend some time talking to God. Hanging out with God. There's been many a times in the past and I was going through some difficult times in my life and a lot of things have happened over the years that were significant and painful. And I remember praying on many occasions, God, I don't know what to say. I'm speechless. I don't know how to talk to you today. But God, I just want to feel your presence. I just want to know you're there. I just need, I just need comfort. And it's amazing when you ask, you have not because you ask not. When you ask God for that, it is amazing. I'm not trying to base my faith on feelings, but it is amazing how God, you just sense God right there with you. And you can almost feel him put his arms around you and tell you it's going to be okay. God don't always take those circumstances away, but He certainly promises us that He will walk with us through those circumstances. That we're not meant to be alone. We're not meant to be alone. I don't care what you're going through. None of us should go through any of that alone. The Bible says you draw near to God and He'll draw near to you. If you feel alone, guess who walked away? You can't push God away and expect God to intervene. Draw near to Him. So Mary pondered, thought about, meditated on what was being told to her and what she was experiencing. You know, the Bible doesn't tell us a whole lot about what Joseph is experiencing, but he was just simply operating on faith. He had an encounter with a messenger from God and says, Joseph, don't be afraid to take Mary to be your wife, for what is inside of her comes from the Holy Spirit. She hadn't been with a man. The miracle happening in her womb, Joseph has come from directly from God. And Joseph took her took care of her, and helped her raise those children. 
He operated on faith. And like I said earlier, without faith, it's absolutely impossible to please God. In fact, without faith, it's impossible for you to experience joy. Without faith, it is absolutely impossible for you to feel peace. We've got to operate on faith that, yes, God, I know you got this. I know you're here with me, and I'm just going to give it to you. God, I don't know what to do, how to handle this, or how to go next, but God, I'm just going to trust you, and I want you to carry me through this. Carry me through, and he, he will. Those moments you can't walk alone, He will pick you up and carry you through. But it starts with faith. Let's pray. Father, we thank You so much for Your holy and precious Word. God, it brings conviction, it brings clarity, it brings comfort, and certainly brings peace. And God, I'm just so grateful, grateful, for this time that we could celebrate in, every year and focus on this particular historical event where you sent your son in the fashion in which you sent him. God, we're so grateful that you identify with us in everything that we've ever experienced in life. God, that you understand through your son, Jesus, you understand how we feel. So God, thank you for that. But more importantly, God, thank you, Lord, that you have pursued us that you paid that ultimate price through your son Jesus and how Jesus paid that price and became sin for us. God, we're so grateful knowing that the moment that we surrender to Jesus, we are set free. And God, I'm so thankful that we have been declared righteous because of faith and because of your grace. God, thank you. I pray, God, today that your people who are called by your name will humble themselves to pray today that, God, whatever is distracted them, God, that they'll give that over to you. Realizing those distractions are put there by the enemy to keep us from experiencing joy and peace. So, God, I pray that no one will leave these doors today without that burden lifted off their shoulders, that God, everyone that walks out today and everyone listening online, God can walk away today with a new sense of joy and peace that passes our understanding. In Christ's name, would you stand with me? This altar's open. This altar's open. If you just want to come and pray, you, 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 you've got something that has distracted you and has consumed you. Maybe your thoughts, or maybe you're just all focused. Maybe... Things are just hard right now. God knows what you're going through. Maybe you're up against something. You don't know what's going to happen next. God knows you. He sees you. Draw near to Him. He'll draw near to you. Come and present that burden to Him today. Come and present that burden to Him today. Give it to Him. Give it to Him. Don't hang on to it. Give it to Him so that you can walk away with a sense of peace today. Come on. This altar's open.